when the Lord was riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we know that it is the culmination of his ministry on earth. He knows as he rides there that the crucifixion and resurrection are imminent, and proclaiming himself as king on that day is integral part of that process. What we might come to understand is that a major shift was taking place at that time, orchestrated precisely by the Lord. The crowds at that day, knowing that the Lord had done all these miracles and hearing some of his teachings, came to witness him as the Messiah who was taking on the pageantry of kingship. But they did not know what kind of king he was. They called him the king of Israel in an earthly sense. And so we note that they celebrate him on that day only to go home disillusioned because he did not fulfill their worldly hopes. Instead, the message of Palm Sunday, as we know, is that he's a different kind of king. Later, he would say, My kingdom is not of this world. Yes, I am a king, but of a spiritual kingdom called heaven and the church. If we think about the people gathered on Palm Sunday, the disciples themselves amongst that crowd had a better chance of understanding this, but even they needed some help. There's a small detail at the end of the story of Palm Sunday as it's recorded in the Gospel of John that reflects on them. It says, as they watched all this pageantry, they did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that he had done done those things to him. And we can see a shift in their perspective happening as they sequentially became aware of the Lord's divine plan and their own place in it. It's informative to fast forward a week of the story into the road road to Emmaus, because a very similar shift took place to the two people who were also amongst the Lord's disciples. They found themselves walking with the Lord, the risen Lord, but at first they did not know it. And most of us can recall that story of how Jesus got them to tell him why they were sad and confused, including the Palm Sunday story and the news of the empty tomb. They too failed to understand, and they said that we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. But listen to what the Lord said to them, the way he invited them to rethink things, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded on them all in the scriptures the things concerning himself. He shifted their perspective, a process that culminated later when they dined with him, and he knew him and he vanished from their sight. Recently, I've been engaged in a study of ways in which the Lord consistently shifted the perspective of people in his word. Wise shifts in perspective. It's his work of leading people to attain wisdom, and it's an incredible lens through which to look at the word. We encounter stories like Jacob, and his dream of a ladder reaching into heaven when he was fleeing from his brother Esau. And we hear him saying, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Can we see the shift in his perspective as he was fleeing for his life to a time when he came to understand the Lord's covenant and that the Lord would be with him and that all would be well? Or what of Elisha? who calmed his servants when an enormous Syrian army surrounded them. Do not fear, he said, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Or we could think about Samuel. Surely Samuel, who spoke directly with the Lord, would know what's what. But when the Lord sent him to Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel, 
We hear him say, do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So often the Lord shifted people's perspectives, raising their thoughts to a spiritual way of viewing life. You have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you, enter by the narrow gate rather than the broad one. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child will by no means enter it. He who is without sin amongst you, let him cast a stone at her first. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But she, out of the poverty, has given all that she had. And recall also the message that we focused on already today, my kingdom is not of this world. So much of this the people on Palm Sunday did not understand. Even the disciples were blind at first to a large portion of it until the resurrection when things finally began to fall into place for them. They needed all these consistent and repeated prompts from the Lord to think more wisely and deeply, to open their minds to consider the spiritual dimension of life. And so do we. We might stop and reflect why that is. There's so many reasons, but listen to just three teachings from the writings of the new church, which help us to understand why we need the Lord's help. First, we have trouble, when we admit it, thinking beyond what we can see and touch. Often we're locked into this world. There's a teaching that says about spirits who believe uh, about our spirits, that we live in a human form after death, clothed, as it says, in brilliant garments and living in magnificent dwellings. But for people for whom that's a new concept, it says, let them think from sense experience, that is to say, from their body and its senses, and will they then not stop there and finally deny Sounds like many of the people watching the Lord ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, locked into a worldly way of thinking about that. However, this passage continues, let people who can be drawn away from sensual and bodily things be raised above these things and then think. Then for the first time they can enter into wisdom. Isn't it true that what the Lord most wants to give us is beyond the sight of our eyes in this world that we're born into? Love, safety in his presence, lasting happiness, true fulfillment and contentment, peace. Wisdom is found in pursuing those things. Another reason that we might have trouble or need help from the Lord to attain wisdom is that when things go wrong, it's hard to trust in him. Think again of those disciples who had the best chance of trusting in the Lord. The Lord prepared them for the events to come, saying, all of you will be made to stumble before me this very night. And we may recall Peter, who boldly predicted that he would never deny the Lord, only to be humbled later that very day, to deny the Lord vehemently three times before the rooster crowed. With that in mind, we are well to reflect on our own experiences of great turmoil in our lives and listen to this teaching. As long as temptation lasts, people assume that the Lord is not present, for they are being harassed by evil genii, so harassed, in fact, that sometimes they have so great a feeling of hopelessness as to scarcely believe in the presence of the Lord at all. We know that feeling sometimes, but mercifully the Lord doesn't lead us there because the teaching continues, yet at such times the Lord is more closely present with people than they can possibly believe. And once temptation subsides, they receive comfort, believing for the first time that the Lord is present. We can think and know and believe in the Lord, but we know that faith will be tested. 
And finally, we can think about this challenge that we often think that we know when we don't. In fact, this is the third thing that we're taught about why we get sort of locked in a natural way of thinking rather than a spiritual. Interesting, it's a paradox of wisdom known to the angels. We can think of those people who used to live here and follow the Lord to heaven as some of the most wise and intelligent of people that they are. But it says, among the angels themselves, who possess a supreme light of intelligence and wisdom, holiness still dwells within ignorance. For they know acknowledge that of themselves they know nothing, and that whatever they do know comes from the Lord." goes on to make a statement about us. Anyone who does not acknowledge that there is an infinite number of things that they do not know compared with what they do know cannot possess the holiness of angels. And another teaching says that angels know, use an analogy that compared to what they do know, it's like a drop in the water relative to the ocean. So how often do we think of things that we don't know? Think of what's going on with people around us that we may think that we know, but we really have no idea. Or sometimes we believe that we've got it all figured out only to hear someone challenge us with a question that we don't have the answer to. Or we feel confident in the plan that we have for our lives only to encounter a twist in life that requires us to rethink things and turn anew to the Lord for help. Again, we can think about those people on Palm Sunday laying down their clothes and their palms. They thought they knew the Messiah was coming into the capital city. They did see the Messiah coming into the capital city, but they were seriously mistaken about what he was there to accomplish. Well, the Lord has this consistent effort to lead us to greater and greater states of wisdom. He doesn't leave us in those states of doubt or confusion because he is consistently causing us to grow and learn. He can enlighten us in helpful ways, and he's always willing to work with us. He's always inviting us to the next shift in our perspective that has us cooperate with him more fully and wisely. Earlier in the service, we heard three statements about true wisdom. And let's review a little bit about what the Lord wants us to see as people who are cooperating with him. True human wisdom, we read, consists in perceiving the existence of God, the nature of God, and what pertains to God. This is what divine truth of the word teaches. And do we not hear the call to turn to the Lord who rode into Jerusalem, who died on the cross, who rose again on Easter Sunday, and so is offering to be our Redeemer and Savior? If we do nothing else from our time in the presence with the Lord today, then renew our commitment to turn to him and to devote ourselves more fully to him, then we will have discovered the single most powerful means to true wisdom there is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Again, we read, true wisdom is to see what is conducive to everyone's life to eternity and to determine oneself according to that, which is done when people not only know these things and perceive them with their understanding, but also will and do them. And isn't that what the people had the opportunity to consider by means of the Lord's teachings? My kingdom is not of this world. Heaven is the place that the Lord is leading us. Spiritual life and the things of spiritual reality are primary. Think spiritually and not naturally and we'll be wise, or at least on the path to wisdom. And if we live spiritually, as this passage requires, with the things of spiritual life in mind, we can come into true wisdom. Not only that, but we can come into true happiness, for living in these ways is what allows the Lord to bless us. Finally, we read, few people know how a person is led to true wisdom. Intelligence is not wisdom, but it leads to wisdom. 
for having an understanding of what is true and good is not the same thing as being a true and good person, but being wise is. Wisdom can be used only in reference to a person's life, what kind of person they are. So we can ask ourselves, what kind of people do we want to be? Lord-based people, trusting, other-oriented, wise, humble, kind-hearted and generous, free from hereditary inclinations to evil that plague us, able to share word-based perspectives with those that we love that work for us and may work for them, content, useful, all of those things and so many more can be ours to the extent that we turn to the Lord and orient ourselves to his path. Well, like the Lord did for the people on that day he rode into Jerusalem, he's constantly striving to shift our perspective, to help us to grow in wisdom. Like the disciples, there will be times when we do not understand these things at first, but later remember and have it all fall into place for us. Like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, the Lord will be walking with us through life, even though sometimes we don't know it or acknowledge it, listening to us describe our confusion and sadness, our challenges and frustrations. Always he's seeking for ways to lead us to greater levels of understanding, even if sometimes it's through gentle chiding, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. But to the extent that we are paying attention and make the commitment to strive for wisdom that the Lord so generously offers, there will be times when we come to know of his presence and providence in our lives. Our eyes will be opened and our hearts will burn within us as we come to realize that the Lord is always with us and has a plan for our lives that stretches out into eternity to the extent that we are wise enough to follow him. Amen.